uh, some of our audience engage. Uh, Liam, you have a question. Um, I have a question for all the panel, if you please. I'll, th I'll start off with the uh, Chagas man. I'm an ex on Forest Luntus, which then turned to uh, Chagas. And you were saying there, and Bobby said there, about research in relation to slurry into the ground and drilling it in. That research was done over 30 years ago, and nothing was done since. So talking about now, if you're going to start doing things like that, are you going to wait another 30 years before you move on? I mean, this sort of carry-on is not acceptable at all. Uh, 30 years later, we, we were able to, Dr. Forrester was able to go along and inject slurry into it. Three days later, I was able to put cattle back out in that. But if you spread slurry, apart from going up in the air and wasting it, you have to wait three weeks before you can let the cattle out. And another thing, I move on to Bobby Elwood. Bobby, you stood there about the Mercer thing. Uh, a bit, uh, kind of hit a, a nerve there with me. Uh, this is this in relation is to bringing in implanted beef into this country. Isn't that correct? Uh, well, we don't know that. I mean, the well, potentially, yeah. potentially, it's coming from Brazil and South America. That's the traceability I'm thinking of. Well, well, you're also talking about the, Mer the Mercer, which in fact brings in that kind of thing, uh, beef. In 1986, the, uh, the Fianna Fáil government banned implants in this country, and now we're going to turn around and we're bringing in uh, implanted beef. You know, it doesn't make sense whatsoever. You, you, you know, your policies are, 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 are not corrupt, but they're twisted. Okay, let our panel answer that, Liam. So, uh, uh, Pat, we'll start with you then. Yeah, first of all, on the Mercosur deal, first of all, the Mercosur deal is, is obviously, it's gone on, as Liam probably obviously knows, it's 20 years in, in, in the making. Uh, and we're now at a stage whereby there is a draft agreement. Uh, but that draft agreement will depend on a lot of things. First of all, I personally feel there's an inherent contradiction in the deal. Uh, if we're going to bring uh, beef uh, from Brazil uh, and cut down rainforests in Brazil and ship the beef that has produced over there halfway around the world, I think it's not going to do anything for, for climate change. Uh, but uh, the deal is going to be dependent on that uh, whatever beef has come into this country, into Europe, First of all, as, as Bobby said, there's 270,000 tonne of beef coming from that part of the world already. The proposal is another 100,000 tonne will come in. But it has to meet the same criteria as, uh, from an animal welfare point of view, as we have here. It has to meet the, serum, meet the same traceability conditions as we have here. It just can't be any bit of beef uh, be, uh, that uh, may come in. If, for example, as, Liam, as you might be suggesting, Liam, that there's going to be hormones and whatever else in, in this beef, it cannot come into, this, into Europe and will not come into Europe because there has to be a traceability element around that. With regard to the slurry issue, I think uh, we need to move on with the slurry issue rapidly. There is no doubt that the, the proposal uh, that Frank has, has mentioned there about the, the, uh, putting the, the slurry into the ground rapidly is the way forward. Uh, I personally believe that in the new cap that has not been negotiated, presently <coughs> negotiated, there has to be more incentives for, for farmers now, agricultural contractors, to, uh, to purchase the machinery that is required to do that, and that is the way forward. Why is it taking so long? That was part of his question. Why is it taking so long? I suppose he, a lot of farmers already are going down that road, as probably Frank will, uh, will have the figures uh, more readily available than I would, but a lot of farmers are going down that road at the moment. I personally feel that that contractors, and a lot of farmers now would use contractors for spreading slurry because it's obviously quicker and faster and so on and so forth. Uh, I think there needs to be, a, and in the present schemes, contractors can't avail of grant aid. That needs to be changed, in my opinion, uh, to incentivise that. But I, I, just going back to a, a more general point in regards, Frank, I think in fairness to Tagus, they have a roadmap, they've put a roadmap now in place. Uh, that can bring farming to the next stage, which is required. It can reach those targets, as Frank has made, between 10 and 15% reductions by 2030. And we're going to have to have other targets beyond 2030 as well, which are very important. But I think there's a roadmap in place for the first time in a long time that if everybody buys into, we can achieve that uh, by everybody working together. Again, as Pat O'Keefe said, I think there needs to be a bit of coming together by everybody in this regard, be it the farm organisations, uh, be it Tagus who have the roadmap in place now at the moment, by everybody working together to achieve, achieve a common goal of reducing, uh, reducing uh, the emissions by 2030. It can be done by everybody working together. Okay, we'll let Frank briefly answer as well. Yeah, look, you're dead right. There was a lot of research done on slurry, you know, back 30, 40 years ago. I remember some of it myself, I'm that old. And uh, I suppose what we did in recent years was quantify the losses of, of uh, ammonia and greenhouse gases from, from different slurry methods. And it showed that the, the, the ones that got it close to the ground, whether it was injecting or a dribble bar or the, the um, trailing shoe, were much better in terms of, of the amount of losses uh, of greenhouse gases and ammonia. And the reason why farmers didn't, I suppose, adopt it over the years, because there were all the benefits, like you say, you can get out onto grass uh, quicker after putting it on and, and so on, there's less, less smell. The reason, I suppose, is that the capital cost of the equipment 
uh, was, was quite high. So now it is grant aided, as you say, it's not grant aided for, for contractors, but that's, I suppose, what has happened. And I suppose that as a result of the research on the amount of emissions coming from it now, uh, farmers that are availing of a derogation are going to have to use the, the, um, the low emissions slurry spread in the trail and shoe or the dribble bar from mid next year. Oh, CGF, sorry. Oh, yeah, sorry. It's, it's all capped at the eyeball. When you yeah. It's all capped in trying to get the cotton of feeding back into the soil. It's still with all nitrogen and NO2. Yeah. Why didn't you talk about that? I mean, this research is 30 years old. Yeah, I, I'm going to be so old now that I won't yeah. even see it. Okay. Well, look, maybe, maybe life come back to us and give well, us the benefit of your Lee, advice, maybe, but I never heard maybe of that Maybe afterwards, one. if our yeah, panel please sticks please around, please. we'll be able to get into some Did more detail please. in the audience. Uh, Lucy, Glenn Denning and James Murphy and this man at the front. So... We'll go to Lucy first. Hi, um, I'm not a farmer. Um, essentially, I'm sorry. Um, I'm a breastfeeding counsellor with Quidu, the um, Irish Childbirth Trust. <coughs> so my question is, it's kind of twofold. Um, I believe, I'm not sure whether I've got my fingers absolutely correct, but I, I hope I have. Um, next spring, there will be 750,000 calves born in Ireland. Uh, these will essentially be waste from the dairy industry. So first of all, do the panelists have any concerns re animal welfare um, of these young animals being sent, uh, being shipped um, abroad for, to be slaughtered for the veal industry? Um, is it economical? And the second um, part of the question is, is there a massive contradiction in encouraging Irish women to breastfeed here in this country while we export five million tins of formula approximately to China um, every week? Are we in danger of becoming the Nestle of China? Which is, there's been a boycott there since 1978. Okay, thank you, Lucy. I think we'll go straight to Pat for this one. Two easy ones. Um, okay, so the calf one um, first, um, 750,000 calves. Um, so there's, the, obviously there's a beef herd and there's a dairy herd, and obviously the calves from the beef herd are for beef production, the calves from the dairy herd are half or, you know, a <laughs> proportion going for replacements, and the, the balance going, going for beef. Um, we do export, the, you know, the figures are publicly available in terms of the number of calves exported. I think it's 180,000 calves were exported from Ireland last year, you know, under a highly supervised European regime in terms of the standards, in terms of the number of hours and all that. I know, you know, you mightn't agree with it in terms of, but again, it is regulated and, and supervised by the Department of Agriculture in terms of calf welfare. Um, from a Glambia perspective, we'd be very strict in terms of and likewise other processors in Ireland will be in terms of the standards that farmers are, are required to do by law in terms of calf welfare, in terms of compliance, in terms of tagging all the calves, in terms of the calves not being allowed to move off the farm until they're a certain age, and in terms of they're actually fit, fit to leave the farm. Um, there's no doubt, I think, there's been a lot of coverage in the agri-media in recent weeks and recent months about this issue because, you know, the, it's, it's no secret that the industry has grown quite rapidly post the abolition of milk quota in terms of farmers had been restricted until 2015. They've expanded quite rapidly, herds have expanded, um, and farmers are having to adjust now in terms of investing in calf housing, in terms of having more space to be able to keep those calves for longer, to be able to market them, because we do have a seasonal system. Um, so I wouldn't take, the, you know, we have actually very high standards of animal welfare and our farmers, and some of them are here and they can speak for themselves, but they're very proud of calf welfare. Um, we sent a booklet to 4,500 farmers in recent days with advice from our vets in terms of how to manage their calves. I'll give you a copy of that booklet. And I think we're very proud of the standards that the farmers achieve. And if the farmers don't achieve those standards, we'll stop collecting their milk. So in twin last year, we stopped collecting milk from farmers that weren't achieving the Borbia Estas certification. And if under the calf heading, which is part of Estas, if they fail to achieve the calf requirements in terms of the Estas, well, they're no longer eligible for milk collection because they're in breach of their, um, they won't have their Estas certification. All of our milk. How many farmers, just as a matter of interest, how many farmers did, you switch? did you stop taking their milk from? It was farmers that hadn't um, achieved Estas certification. So we have 100% of our milk from farms. It wasn't for calf reasons. It was for just, they hadn't, the Borbi audit is done. You have to get um, um, through the Estas process. And again, one of the farmers and here can tell. And did how many didn't get through it? As well? um, like a handful or just? Uh, Ballpark. Small number, but they didn't. So 100% of our 4,500 farmers now have Estas certification. And if, if tomorrow someone, I mean, there's an there's a ongoing cycle of, of audits, and if somebody falls out of that process, there's a process for actually achieving compliance. So we, I mean, I can, 
I don't know if I want to name it a no, number no, public no, forum. I'm happy to give you the, the, a small number. A small we'll number, say. but they, 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 you know, Borbia set the bar, and these farmers weren't able or willing to meet the standard in terms of you know what was required. Okay, so calves, calves is part of that. And the um, second question. Second part of the question, yeah. Um, look, I suppose. In Ireland, we have, so Glanbia does not export infant formula in a can. We, we supply ingredients to the, to the sector. And in Ireland, um, there are some of the large multinationals that produce that, um, you know, Nestle, Danone and Abbott's have facilities in Ireland that export. And, and we're a supplier to that sector in terms of ingredients. Um, there's very strict regulations around that sector in terms of uh, breastfeeding and in terms of advertising. And I think that's really important that that is, is regulated the way it is. So in terms of what they can and can't do in terms of encouraging. And I know there's a code. Yeah, and I know there's yeah there's issues around it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but it but it's so in other words, I suppose. We Did you say it's not law? Okay. Yeah, it's just in terms a, code. Of a code. Correct. Yeah, and it, uh, but look, I suppose we we supply the sector with ingredients. Um, we're we're you know they're they're it's a highly regulated sector in China as well as globally. Um, and I think it's, you know, it's, it's important that breast is first choice. We, you know, we wouldn't disagree with that advice. Um, but then mothers obviously are entitled to make their own choices after that. And we're not, no, we're not, we're, we don't sell directly. We don't sell, we don't sell any products. We supply ingredients. ingredients. So we supply lactose, we supply, you know, powders, dried powders for that, that sector. Okay, thank you. Great questions. James Murphy, Kilkenny IFA, Chairman of the local IFA here. Thanks, Emer. Um, just first and foremost, just on, on your, your beam observations, Pippa, mm -hmm. there's, there's, there's a, an area there that you um, may not be aware of. There was a sector uh, of mm -hmm. beef finishers that were excluded, yes, yes. dairy farmers, mm -hmm. which was absolutely wrong. Now, if, they, if dairy farmers who finished their own animals, who were involved in, in finishing of beef, had to be allowed to join Beam, the 22 million would have been all allocated and would have been all taken up. And IFA is still calling for that issue to be addressed. And, and again, look, we spoke earlier. Um, I have, with the greatest respect, uh, I, I accept the points you make about organics. And, and it has a real role to play. We have 140,000-ish farmers in Ireland we have 70,000 or 7,000 certified organic farmers. About 50% of them will tell you that they can get a percentage of their product away at organic prices. The rest goes at conventional prices. So it's a market that we'd have to seriously grow. Uh, look, Eamor, I welcome the debate. I think we need more nights like this and society needs more nights like this because this debate, it's new, uh, it's alarming a lot of people and in many cases it's all over the place. And I think we all want to see um, a common progress on Ireland's challenge to cl climate change. Um, from my own perspective, I think farmers and agriculture, because of the finger pointing that we're currently experiencing, have become overly defensive. Uh, and I think we need to be more open uh, and more receptive to, to new ideas. I welcome Frank's observations, and I think that's central to, to where we move forward. Um, and I think Chagas has certainly opened, upped its game in that area. Um, I, I, I would say, sure, uh, Ireland's greenhouse gas emissions would raise flags, no doubt about that. But they also underline the importance of agriculture to Ireland as an economy. And the fact that we don't have heavy industry, as most other European countries have, to dilute their agricultural emissions. And that's not dodging any. We, we have a responsibility in agriculture. Farmers are well prepared to accept that and to start dealing with it. But, uh, you know, we've got to, the, the, the debate has got to be driven by fact uh, and, and, uh, and by common sense and not by environment and climate change alarmism. And I'm a little worried about some of the, some of the, the commentary that we're seeing. Um, I, I just make a, a further quick point before I ask my question. Um, Frank <laughs> made the... Welcome yeah. to the panel tonight, James. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, no, again, it's relevant. Um, <laughs> some of the panel made the point that, that we have a duty to feed the world. And we're now seeing that uh, uh, food production needs to increase by 50% by 2050 to feed the world. We're very good at producing top quality food here in Ireland. We have a climate that suits. We have highly skilled farmers. If we're forced to scale back production, 
Other countries, and Pat alluded to this, other countries that are not producing to the same sustainably high standard as we're uh, uh, currently producing to and, and aspire to will step into the breach. And I'm not sure that will benefit. And the question I see regularly in my travels around Europe, and again, um, um, Pat O'Keefe alluded to, to the progress that Land B are making. Other countries, almost every other country in Europe, has put schemes in place, the government has put schemes in place to allow farmers and to facilitate farmers to get involved in mitigation actions, whether that's renewable energy, whether that's uh, the bioeconomy, whether that's new alternatives like growing hemp, etc. Uh, yes, they've been supported, but they've allowed farmers to diversify and in many cases to actually move away from livestock production. Uh, what would the panel think? Wh why have we foot dragged for so long? Why have successive governments foot dragged in this area? And what would the panel think of that? Okay, and ideally, James, who would you like to answer your question? Um, hey, I'm sure they all have opinions. I'm sure they all have opinions. <laughs> I okay. just wanted to actually, yeah. I, I'm going to pass the question over to the, the government TD here. So, <laughs> the, <laughs> but I was just going to address the, the exactly, yeah, he, he, but I was going to just address the, the that whole narrative about us feeding the world and yeah. We're fantastic. We produce enough food for 50 million people, but we can't actually feed ourselves. You know, we're net importers of food. That's a big issue, you know. We need to be a bit more self-sufficient in how we, what we grow and, and what we produce and what we eat ourselves. You know, there's no point really us feeding 50 million people if, if we're going to be struggling, if climate crisis gets worse or if we're isolated ourselves. So I think that's important to consider, to keep that in Frank mind. Frank is shaking his head here. Yeah, yeah. We're, in some ways you're right and in some ways you're wrong. Like we produce enough milk and beef to feed about 50 million people, but obviously then we import a lot of food. But if you look at the overall calories that we produce, produce in this country of food, it's enough to feed, I did the calculation while ago, I can't remember the exact answer, but you know, somewhere maybe 13 to 15 million people. So we're not net importers of food, we produce... We're net importers know. of calories or energy of food. No, we're I not, think. we're net exporters of calories and protein. Well, we're net importers of something because we don't we're, grow we, enough yeah, of a whole pile we, we of things. We certainly, we're, we're importers of fruit. We're huge importers of things like prepared consumer foods, which is your, your jams, your breakfast pizzas, cereals your stuff, yeah. breakfast cereals, all those Well, we're net importers kind of, of potatoes. We're net importers apples. of carrots, apples, yeah. onions. Yeah, but when you put Plenty the whole basket, when well, you put I the know, whole but basket we shouldn't, together. But, that, but there, there's potential for, I'm not saying for, yeah. deer, mm. for beef farmers to diversify into growing yeah. carrots, but there's farmers yeah. out there who the don't all want to produce all beef. They don't all want to come out of college and be borrowed whack load of money to become a dairy farmer they want other options okay. and we're not providing but we need to be careful on that one because if that one gets put around a lot it's a little <coughs> not bugbear i grow my own vegetables but it's not ever going to be viable for me to start supplying the local you know market with vegetables well, there are there are there are I know, vegetable and there, growers there are, there who it is people, viable yeah, but there and they're employing yeah, they're but employing but like maybe 10 people yes, on on yes, a yes, couple yes, of yes, absolutely. I work as an example. yeah absolutely but there's i work keelings country crest and they're brilliant at what they do but it's not going to be for everyone in terms of eighty thousand beef farmers switching I to vegetables we need to be realistic it's not fair to farmers be telling them you i'm know, not telling i'm saying that it's an option and i specifically said not necessarily for beef farmers there are other farmers out but there cons consumers I mean, the, the ifa have a horticultural chair yeah. He's representing a certain number of farmers who are probably struggling a lot because yeah. there's no supports there. And below cost selling is huge issues for them and you know the power of the retail chains. There's a huge amount of issues. But, but again, for, to, when farmers are being told, you know, you know, I'm not accusing you people of, of telling them, but you know, people on the radio or on the television saying you know, farmers need to diversify. But farmers, if somebody's earning their living from it, you know, it's, it's very unfair to be telling them you should earn a living in a different way. If they've chosen beef as what, you know, they want to make a living out of beef. You just need to be careful in terms of being realistic about what's, like the people that are in vegetables are a very small number. They're highly professional, they're highly skilled because the consumer expects clean, they expect fresh. And okay. yes, farmer's markets are brilliant, Back but it's not for everyone. James an answer for his question. And you'll have to forgive me, James. You'll have to remind us briefly of your question. Yeah, I'll answer Jim's question in a second. I think the, f the first point I'd like to make is that, no, like just, just br a brief point. Uh, there's only one group of people going to produce food, and they're farmers. Nobody else is going to produce food. And in Ireland, we do it very well, and farmers do it very, very well. We're the most efficient dairy producers uh, in Europe, and I think everybody will agree with that. We're the fifth most efficient producers of beef in Europe. I think nobody would disagree with that. 
And I think that point has to be made and has to be not be forgotten about as well. We do things very well in Ireland and we're very proud of the way we do it and we're very bright to be proud of it. Answering James's question. Uh, I think the next round of CAP, which is presently being negotiated, is going to be crucial uh, to how we do things. Uh, it, there is going to be a massive change in, in, in the whole process and the structure, which is very important. In the past, uh, it's called a common agriculture policy for a reason, I suppose, because it's supposed to be the same policy for every country in Europe. Uh, every country, the, the, when we joined uh, Europe in uh, 1973, there was a very small number of countries in Europe compared to where we are at the moment. There were mainly the countries like ourselves, Great Britain, France, Germany. Uh, Europe has, has diversified and changed in the last number of years. We have a lot of countries from Eastern Europe who have joined Europe, who have a totally different uh, concept of farming, if I could put it as such, and have totally different, uh, totally different aims and aspirations and totally different targets uh, in, their, in their own way. But, and so the common agriculture policy of, of 1973 and in more recent years is totally different from now. And hence, the idea has been changed completely, whereby there's going to be maximum flexibility for our country to do things that we need to be able to do uh, to facilitate the problems that we have, be it from a climate change point of view. So we can develop our own plans to suit the farmers of Ireland, not the farmers of, of Romania or wherever else. So there was a, a consultation process as well uh, announced in the last number of, of days by the Department of the Minister uh, with regard to the climate change agenda. We have, every sector has a target to make, uh, to reach, as Frank was, uh, alluded to earlier on. Uh, and it's very important that everybody and every farm organisation, every farmer uh, and every stakeholder is brought along that journey together. That's why the consultation process was, was announced. It is open for the next number of weeks. It is important everybody feeds into that process so that when the consultation process is finished and when a decision is made, everybody will have had their fair say into that process so that everybody will know where they're going together. So when the cap, that's a single part of it, but when the cap is coming forward again, I think the cap is the crucial thing so that we can have a common goal going forward uh, that is going to suit Ireland and Irish farmers. And the IFA are obviously very worried about the cap and the proposed 5% cut. A absolutely. It is. Every farm organisation, every farmer will be very concerned about that. And this is based on, the, as we all know, the fact that our nearest neighbours, Great Britain, are going to be who are a net contributor to that budget. Uh, are going to be le are going to be leaving. As are we. We're net contributors. Yeah, but, but, okay. but we don't put you, we don't put in 11 billion euro be, every no, year. No, we, we want to be our own taxpayers' money. But, we're getting but, back. But, yeah, but, but we don't put, but four, did, four billion came directly from into the cap from Britain. We so want to be briefer with our answers because we'd like to get some more questions in. Sorry, Frank, just to finish off on okay, James's question. I, I just want to support Pippa on the diversification option. I think it is a shame that we import so many potatoes into this country. It's a part of our culture. It's we a surprise to me tonight. Yeah, actually yeah. and look we've made we Chagas and the industry have made good inroads in the last couple of years into the salad potato we've we've got growers in ireland growing the little salad potato you buy we're now working on the chip and potato Chips, it's difficult mm -hmm. though because the scale of the op the chip uh, producers in the uk and in holland is huge, huge compared to us so economies of scale make that different but we're we're working on it just in relation to the bioenergy like the you have to have a market for it you know we've seen crops uh produce for bioenergy and the market really wasn't uh, developed so they, they haven't gone well the anaerobic digestion is now you know there's a lot of talk about it and gas nets works ireland have proposals to produce 20 percent of their gas from n renewable sources and um the, the problem though is if, if you're going to do that from from grass and slurry is really challenging to meet the sustainability standards for that because what it means is for every unit of um of energy you produce out of it of renewable energy biomethane in other words you can only use 0.3 of a unit of energy to produce it. So if you start using nitrogen fertilizer to grow your grass, it's very difficult to, to meet those standards. So, so they're not simple questions, I suppose, and we need to be very clear before we, that we're not going to put ourselves into a, a cul-de-sac. Okay, we had a question at the front as well. Good evening, panel. Noel McGoldrick is my name. I'm the chairman of the Irish Shirley Cattle Society, and I'm from the west of Ireland. Uh, my first questions, I suppose, are for Pat Deering. It's recently printed that the agri-sector is responsible for 30% of our carbon footprint nationally. Um, it seems to me that the only target that is on reducing that is reducing that overall by 10 to 15%, but the sole target is the suckler sector. Now, as a Shirley breeder, and, and there's 2,500 of us, our sole customer base is the suckler sector, like many other beef breeds. And those beef breeds have become 
the backbone of a beef industry that has kept this country afloat when everything else was on its knees, including milk. And it's not about a suckler versus dairy or a beef versus dairy, because both have coexisted here for generations and should continue to do so, and please God they will. But it's not that many years ago since milk was on its knees in Ireland, and many people suffered. Beef is in that point at the moment. There's people losing their homes, their farms, etc. as a result. Now, why, Pat, if overall the agri-sector is responsible for 30%, why is it every week, be it in the Independent or the Journal or Agriland or every other form of social media, the only section of that we see targeted is the suckler sector? Because I have to agree with, um, I'm sorry, I forgot your Me, name, Pippa. 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 You said that if the schemes were viable, they would be oversubscribed, not undersubscribed. The BDGP scheme, while we're being told it's on paper a success, there was a 33% exodus from the original uptake of that. The BEAM scheme is undersubscribed. If they're fit for a purpose, if the schemes you're putting forward are fit for purpose and viable and are economically plausible for the people, for the farmers, they would be oversubscribed. Okay, so your question is why? Like, why why are is there a continuous, like, is the suckler sector the underclass of the, of, of the agri sector? Secondly, the Ch Chagas have promoted the exponential unbridled growth in the dairy sector. The lady in the audience here asked the question what is the plan for the 750,000 calves that are to be born next spring? I don't believe that lady got an answer. And I think it's something that needs to be addressed because. We're, we're watching our beef sector go down the swanee. And if, and it's, it's, it's a real possibility, if there becomes a animal welfare issue as a result of this, the, the head of your Chagas dairy research product, pro project, sorry, has admitted that they overlooked the calves coming off the ex expansion as a result of the dairy herd. Now that to me is a criminal statement. Okay. We what is the plan? We'll let uh, Frank respond to that first, yeah, and then we'll bring Pat in for the, the other question you had. Okay, for the first bit anyway, like, well, certainly in our plan around the, or our thinking and, and that around the, the climate issue, it is not certainly targeting the suckler sector. The, the um, measures that we have in there would actually primarily be uh, adopted on, on derogation farms, dairy farms. So the, the slurry spreading methodology, the, the protected urea, all of those are measures they're equally applicable to beef but you know they're certainly not targeting suckler and as i said earlier we we uh it's, it's our um contention that we can reach the targets in the government's climate action plan without the need to to cut the, the herd so Yeah, and that, that's individual farmers making a choice that they want to, to switch into dairy and primarily. The, is it clear the, the profitability of dairy is far higher. So, you know, that's the reality of it. Stabilise beef farmers' incomes. Exactly. Yeah, well, look, the bit we can do about it is the technical efficiency part and, uh, you know, try to get the system as optimised as possible. At, at the current price of beef, Dairy beef or suckler beef is really challenged, and it's not a dairy beef, I, I agree with you, it shouldn't be, this issue shouldn't be portrayed as a dairy beef or a suckler beef issue. No calf that's born next spring, if, uh, if the price is 350, is, is going to have an easy ride through life to make profit. Some, some of them may, some of them will, and, and so on, but it's, um, it's, it's an issue right across the beef industry. What's going to happen to 750,000 calves born um, next spring? Well, you know, if. It, I suppose if, if the market is reasonable, they'll be bought. If the market isn't reasonable, we're going to have a challenge. If that, if that arises, the primary thing has to be to ensure that the welfare of calves, whether they're with us in, in this country for, for four weeks before they might go on a boat, whether they're with us on a farm for two weeks before they might have to go for slaughter, whatever happens to them, they have to be looked after properly. And we've put a lot of effort in with Animal Health Ireland and with others in terms of the, the, um, the, the guidance to farmers around welfare, the, the, the welfare standards of calves, no matter what their value is. Okay, we're just running out of time. I have to let a couple of more people in and we can maybe talk afterwards if people are sticking around, just this gentleman here. Okay, very briefly, Pat, can you answer? Yeah, I suppose I can. Yeah, and I don't want to be kind of evasive about it. First of all, I have no control over what, what's brought in the Farmer's Journal, Agriland or anywhere else. Uh, there is no 
There is no policy to diminish the brief sector in this country. I think both of them have to, to coexist together. Uh, it is very important that they do coexist together. The key problem, in my opinion, is, is it's quite simple. At the moment, beef farmers uh, get 115% of their income from Europe. So they're waiting on the 16th of October every year to get the check in the post or to get the text to say that the money is in the bank. And on the 4th of, of December, they said they got the top up, the 20% or 30% top up. In 1973, when we joined uh, the European Union, 80% of the European Commission budget was going towards agriculture. Once the new cap is negotiated in a year's time or wherever it is, that will be down to 30%. There was a cheap food policy in Europe uh, over many years. And in order to have that cheap food policy, farmers were paid a subsidy in order to supplement their income. And that subsidy has been reducing constantly over the years, down to, as I said, that 30%, which would be the, uh, or less, probably less than 30% uh, in, in 2020, 2021. The debt, you might ask the question, where is the rest of, where is the 50% gone? There are other priority issues, uh, fortunately or unfortunately in Europe at the moment, be it migration or wherever else, defence and so on and so forth. And only 30% of the budget is going towards agriculture. Okay, Noel. Okay, don't seem too happy with the answers. Uh, we'll let you in with your question. Hi, yeah, uh, I'll probably answer some of these first as well with a few comments, but uh, I'll just go back to the start, like in terms of tonight, what place for sustainable agriculture? Just to reset and think, and, and what place? There's a super place for sustainable agriculture. Well, we can't lose track of, of what's been said up here all night. There's four stools. And the biggest one, like there was talks about diversification and different pieces and potatoes and vegetables. There's a reason why so many farmers left those sectors. There's a reason why so many farmers are leaving the suckler sector. And that's to do with the financial piece. Plain and simple, the economics, and you won't go back there unless the economics change, unfortunately. And, and just, just a comment on the calves, sorry, like I, I'm a dairy farmer. I'll, have plenty you're of calves in the spring. <laughs> yeah, but they're not, waste was mentioned earlier, like, they're not waste, they're, they're basically a calf, again, no different than any other calf, and, and they'll eventually end up as a beef animal, in some form, shape, at some stage, on somebody's table somewhere in Europe or in Ireland or in America or wherever. If, if we hit an issue with, with selling calves in the spring, we'll keep them, we'll rear them, until whenever the market allows us to sell them. It's a very, simple basic thing it mightn't be when we'd like to do it but they'll be looked after and they'll be brought to a certain point and then they'll go um and your question I, yeah i could make another half dozen comments but we won't I, one simple question and and prickler frank this is fairly recent so i hope you know it's saying in new zealand they've changed how they, how they look at methane and how they look at the whole cycle and how they're going to actually calculate things and i wonder <coughs> maybe a few comments on what they're doing and what that means. Mm. Okay. And, and if it happened here, maybe what it would mean. Yeah. Right, so, um, so it's not just in, in, in New Zealand. There's other scientific groups around the world saying that the way we currently kind of look at the different greenhouse gases and trying to, trying to equate them all is not right, you know, that they are different. So, so at the moment, we say that a, a kilo of methane is, I don't know, 26 times or 28 times as potent as, green, as carbon dioxide and nitrous oxide is 300 times. And we've these trying to compare apples and oranges. The reason that that's kind of flawed is carbon dioxide stays in the atmosphere for hundreds and hundreds of years. So if you put up carbon dioxide from burning fossil fuel now or whatever, it stays up there for hundreds of years. Methane has a half-life of about 12 or 13 years. So when you put up methane now, it only, it's gone in 12 or 13 years, that methane. Obviously, there's more methane coming along behind it. So because of that difference in the time that they stay in the atmosphere, uh, these scientists and lots, lots of scientific groups say, um, if we want to bring the world to kind of net neutral uh, greenhouse gas emissions, what we've got to do is stabilize methane emissions, uh, which would mean you know, not having them grow anymore, and in fact cutting them a bit maybe by, in New Zealand they're saying 10 to 20% or something. We've got to bring carbon dioxide down to zero, either, you know, by, we'll never bring it down to zero, but we've got to suck as much back out of the atmosphere as we're putting up, and nitrous oxide, we've got to bring it down to zero. So what would it all mean? It would mean that um, in New Zealand they're proposing that, you know, they have a different target for methane. They're saying maybe something like 10 or 20% reduction 
and then a, a different target for their carbon dioxide. It's probably not going to be relevant at all here for at least the next, next decade. The rules are set um, in terms of the, the Paris Agreement. The targets are set, the, you know, the EU has signed up to it, Ireland has signed up to it. We've got the, the current system in place until 2030. And even at that stage, you know, this is politics and science mixing. So it might suit New Zealand or, or Ireland, and it might, I don't know whether it would suit it or not, but it, you know, we might think it's advantageous to us, but for other countries then we'll, we'll maybe argue against that, so. Okay, question? Yeah, this lady in the front, yeah. And we have somebody in the back as well. Hello, uh, just to adjust what you were just saying, saying and the research in New Zealand, um, it seems that uh, research here is, tends to be 20 years behind. Uh, they are now uh, doing multi-species swords in New Zealand. Uh, methane problem, well, there's the microbes in the soil when you don't fertilize with artificial fertilizer that eats methane. So if you have a multi-species sword, you don't need to use their nitrogen or your urea or any of those kind of things. You have the sequestration in a multi-species sword with the root depths, which also brings up the minerals, which means you don't have to dose your animals so much. Uh, you have your dung beetles involved, which eats your eggs from your worm burden, eats your fly eggs as well. Um, there's all these other kind of things. This is nothing to do with organics. This is to do with soil health, fertility, and get them, getting the microbial life going, which essentially a lot of what the farming is happening here in Ireland is um, not doing. Sequestering carbon, you need the root depth. Ryegrass is very shallow. That is not happening unless you have the root depth of a variety of different species. Yeah. Unless you have the tannins and the variety of species in the grass sward, you don't have the inputs then of your fertilizers. So your price of how much it's gonna cost you to grow your sward for your dairy herd is a lot less. Once you've sown it, seeded it, and you start grazing it with a longer window in the rotation so that it has time to recover and your cattle can stay out longer in this. Okay, and your this question, is all, please? My question is that why doesn't Ireland catch up with a lot of this research that is going on, which also proves that methane is consumed by healthy soil, that carbon is consumed by healthy soil and healthy plant life. Your research that is happening in Chagas is very narrow. It is not fulfilling the grass rotation and giving the multi-species sward enough space. Okay, to are we regroup. are we really behind behind the rest Look, of the world? Are we behind New yeah. Zealand? There's some fantastic researchers in New Zealand. In case you get a shock. Okay. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, James. Health yeah. and safety always. Yeah. Look, there are some fantastic <laughs> researchers in New Zealand, but there are some fantastic researchers in Ireland, and some of them in Chagas and others in the universities. And I often, I often actually hear New Zealand colleagues say that Ireland has the best agricultural research system in the world. So anyway, that's, we can all kind of blow our own trump or whatever. We certainly have been looking at soil carbon, and uh, actually we, we published some research there recently that showed the amount of carbon in our mineral soils, now not our, our bogs or our peatlands, the amount of carbon in our mineral soils is the equivalent of 30 years of emissions from, I, from the whole of Ireland. Right? We emit about 60 million tonnes of carbon dioxide every year into the atmosphere. We're storing 30 times that amount in our mineral Not soils. Of course it's in ryegrass swards. Where do you think it is? Where do you think it is, sir? Swards are predominantly ryegrass swards. Absolutely. And we are, look, the, the point you're making about the multi-species swards, look, that's certainly of, of relevance and of interest. We have been researching multi-species swards in Chagas for at least 10 years. U University College Dublin has been researching them. We are putting in a multi-species sward element into our, our main... It's not 25. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, look, we'll take, we, 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 maybe, maybe we're a bit slow, so we'll, we won't go from one species or two species to 25 in one go. We'll go to four or six first and see how we get on with that. I don't think so. Look, the, we, you know, we're, 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 we're very well aware of the soil microbiome, and we've got researchers who are very skilled in, in looking at the soil microbiome. And Irish soils, by and large, have very, very healthy uh, soil microbiomes, including the ones that uh, grow predominantly perennial ryegrass swards. Okay, and at the back, we'll have a final question. Oh, hi. Just, uh, my name is Owen O'Neill. Just, uh, 
First off, I think the Irish beef is an excellent product. I love Tipperary blue cheese. So I just want to say that. Uh, I think the people who will suffer most from the climate change is somebody who gets their house flooded because the rivers have overflowed because there's too much rain or people who suffer from storm damage. That's the people who will suffer the most. I, I look at this for a panel, and to me, my simple mind says, okay, what we should do, one of the, I mean, we're all gonna have to do things, it's not just farmers gonna have to do things, but one of the things we definitely need to do is to reduce the national hair, for sure. That's one thing. Um, out, out, outside of that, but we need to just wake up to who is going to compensate the people who are going to suffer from this climate change. And we're going to suffer from it in Ireland. And people have suffered, for instance, pick it, please, like Inish Teague, there were houses. Sorry, were could flooded. you speak up nice and close? Because some oh, of the panel are struggling to hear you. Oh, you can't. Sorry. That's better, yeah. Sorry, can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Right. I'm seeing people, the people who suffer are the people whose houses have been flooded. Okay, okay, could you ask your question, please, if you My don't My question mind. is, uh, why is there no forestry person up on that panel? One, one man over there mentioned forestry, but we nobody have else so, We have someone Michael in front Summers. of you in the audience, Michael Summers. Uh, if you have a question, he, you might talk to him afterwards. <laughs> okay. And thanks, Michael, for, for joining us. Um, um, and I, I accept your point, though, on, on yeah. flooding and all of that. It's very real. I, in, I work in Casey Law, so the biggest <coughs> news stories we cover are relating to the, the impact of weather events. So today it's localised floodings um, south of the county, roads, uh, farmers contacting us as well. So it is a very real issue. I know we said that was the last one, but this lady appealed to me very nicely. And then Pippa wants to make a point as well. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, my name is Mary Brennan and I live in an intensively farmed area in North Kilkenny. And what I see around me is uh, an agriculture which you men on the panel claim is the best at producing beef and milk, you, and you seem to think it's the best at research in the world. Well, I'd like to point out to you that it has done so at the cost of decimating our biodiversity. There are no wildflowers left on the farms. There are no bees. Insect numbers are massively reduced all over the country. Our rivers are very polluted. Salmon populations almost eliminated. Now, I know farmers are not responsible for all of it, but intensive farming has been responsible for most of it. And I, I think you really need to recognize this point and you need to understand that the world population cannot keep growing and you cannot base an economic system on continuing to grow agriculture. There are limits to growth and agriculture needs to face up to that. And you have to limit your herd sizes, your environmental impacts particularly. And your you question, have got to foster please. wildlife. When are you going to understand that there are limits to growth in agriculture uh, without destroying our wildlife. Um, Bobby Aylward, and we let Pippa <coughs> in as yeah, well. I just want to speak about our forestation first. Uh, that man is right. We're not, we are only 16% of this country is uh, under forestry. In, in the average, the average in, in, in Europe is 40 and up to, 50%, up to 50%. Up to 50% uh, in, in forestry. And unfortunately, uh, even the government at the moment has been in new rules on forestation because of objections. They won't allow people to sow or to plant, or they won't allow people to, to buy environments or objections. They won't allow them to cut the forest that's there already. And, and there's a, a bill coming through the door next week just to make, to stop people from objecting. The serial objectors in this country objecting to, uh, they could be from Donegal and they're objecting to plant, uh, for, uh, afforestation in Kilkenny. That, that has to stop. Uh, there's, plan, there's plants out there, there's forestry out there that's not being allowed to be cut at the moment because of... of, of okay, uh, back, and back to Mary Brennan talking about intensive farming well, in North well, Kilkenny well, and the well, decimation well, all, all of... All I can say is that I think a farmer plays his role. A farmer, as a farmer myself, an active farmer myself, we play a role in biodiversity in that we have to live and we have to reduce food. I, we, we trim hedges, we keep hedges trimmed every year. No, but... But we... Mm. 
That's not real. We don't. We don't need. We don't need need. No, 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 we, we, no, we don't. We, First, okay. and for, first and foremost, we don't even cut hedge until until the time that's permitted, when all bird life and wildlife and everything has gone through it. Well, he could be summoned for doing that. He, he was breaking the law. He was breaking the law. Is I'm it? just talking about the law and regulations are there, and I'm a farmer, and I obey the law. And I bought a hedge so trimmer myself. Yes. Yes, well, okay. we, we cut it in the first, from the 1st of thanks, September. Thanks onwards, to Mary. Sorry, Pippa. Um, you wanted to make yeah, a final I've, point. I've, I've sort of forgotten, but <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I think I'm, I, I'm glad. Look, we've we focus this entirely pretty much on emissions, and we we tend to do this when we have these debates. We get caught up in one subject area, and that's where. And, and you alluded to that. There's more to it. Biodiversity. We are in a biodiversity crisis worldwide, and in Ireland, and in County Kilkenny, and in County Offaly. It's rife, and farmers have the best role to play here. Now, I agree, there are farmers cutting hedges in July, and I have caught them, and I have reported them, and I will call, I will call them out any time I see it. If it's in fields and it shouldn't be done, I will do it. But we have to nurture the farmers who are willing to, to, to do it properly. Because, I mean, there's no, if you're cutting your hedges every year, guys, you're not having any, I'm not, I'm not telling, this is sort of fact, you won't have any berries, you won't have flowers for pollinators, you won't have berries or fruits for, for oh, other shelter, animals. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, reps was good in one sense because I think there was a scheme there, you had to leave your hedges, was it for five years or, or a couple of years anyway? You know, so you, you're getting all of this. I mean, there's a whole lot of things we could be doing, to be honest, for yeah. free as well. Yeah, no, and that's very true. And I think, look, farmers, um, like, I'll give you an example. We have a program with Chagas in terms of an advisory program and in the past it was totally focused on profit. Whereas, not totally, but the vast majority was, whereas the, the new program, which has 11 farmers spread across the catchment area, and things like biodiversity and, and uh, sustainability measures are absolutely central to it. I, I mean, I take your point in terms of, I mentioned at the start the program we have right. in East Cork about the Bride project, really good. And it's, farmers are learning, intensive farmers, you know, in terms of hedgerows, in terms of what type of species to plant. And I'm getting queries from people about, you know, you know what's the best shelter belts to plant? And, Farmers have always planted shelter belts because they know the value that hedges do in terms of shelter. They have more to learn in terms of biodiversity. I mean, the river programs, like I mentioned at the start about more planting on, on the banks of the rivers. I mean, reps got a lot of the rivers fenced off, which was great progress, but now we have to move beyond that. So there's a program um, with Chagas again involved on, on all the local um, ASAP, it's called, it's an advisory program, but basically tackling water quality, so doing it properly, going down along a river and saying, testing the water, what's the problem? Is it up along here? Is it this farm? Is it that farm? Is it the, the local village? And tackling the, the problem, actually improving. I mean, I, I don't take your point that our rivers are decimated. We have, we have a okay. very, no, no, we very high standard. The EPA stats are there, but, but we need to make sure we maintain those standards and improve on them where there is problems. And if there's farmers polluting the rivers, we need to tackle them. And we, uh, you know. Just, just to add that, just to add that. I, I, I'm a farmer in Riffs, and I have every, and I have a river in, in two, my, uh, two farms that I have outside farming and, and low. And I have a river in two, and all my rivers are fenced off uh, and have been for years on the Riffs. Well, but that's not my, I mean, there, there might be other reasons, but all my, uh, no animals can go into my rivers, have them all fenced off, and have, have done it with years. Just to say farmers are playing their part in biodiversity, <coughs> are trying to play their okay. part and the hedge cutting, I also planted, I also planted uh, uh, nearly 1,200 um, skiok in the last two years. So don't say we're not playing our part, we're playing our there part. There are about three or four more, more questions in the room, but I'm just conscious some people will want to go home, so will we talk afterwards, or will we take a few more? It, is the panel okay just, to take some more? I just wanted to make, actually, forestry yep. was the thing I was going to talk about. And um, the forestry model, I think, on the whole, everyone, well, a lot of people agree, it isn't the way it should be in Ireland. No. You know, I mean, you go to Leitrim, they don't want to see another tree ever again, whatever type it is nearly at this stage, because it's just yeah. obliterated. 
Um, now, actually, your party, uh, Bobby, voted in favour of a Green Party motion there to have a closer to nature forestry model, which is all about giving farmers far more opportunities to maybe plant, you know, smaller amounts on their farms. Because at the moment, the current model is a big, you know, plantation of X number of hectares all in nice rows, and it's usually, usually some sort of conifer, um, and it's usually for a clear fell, and, you know, in th 30 years' time, and off you go again. Whereas I think farmers are, are reluctant to do that, and I can see that. Now, we have a small amount of forestry on our farm, and we tried really hard to try and have a mixed, sort of diverse, sort of native species. And it was really hard, because the foresters were saying, ah, oh, geez, they won't grow there. You'd be better off with the old spruce, and it'll fly it there. So, you know, we have spruce sort of against our will, almost. But th that was what we were... I agree. There's a role for commercial. I, I, I appreciate that. And nobody has ever mentioned that. True. So when you go up and you say that Sicta spruce is bad, you ask any grower in this part of the world or any place else, what makes the money and butter the parsnips? I'm not disagreeing with that. Spruce. I'm saying we have, but our forestry model is pretty much 90% Sitka spruce. We have 1%, we have 1% <laughs> of our, <coughs> of our forestry cover in Ireland, 1% is native. 1% of Irish, forestry plantation of cover is, is well, there's native. A for that. There's a reason for that too. Uh, this man is right. Commercialism has come into it. And if I'm not we, denying if we, that. If we don't saw enough trees to keep, keep planting, then we won't have commercialism because the, the a spruce, a spruce, a spruce is, is 25 years you have it, you can harvest it. You're talking about broad leaf and uh, you're talking about oak or anything. You're talking about 120 years. Don't even see it. You'll grow it now, but you'll sow it now or, or plant it okay. now. But you won't, you won't cut it or your grandchildren will cut it. We That's have to let in another question since our panel are happy to continue. Uh, Councillor David Fitzgerald of Fine Gael, he's in the front row here. Uh, thanks for an interesting discussion. What, uh, what strikes me at the end of this discussion is a lack of sense of urgency. I follow this debate like everybody else. And you look at the transport sector, they're talking about a 10-year plan to radically change transport. I was at an energy discussion, a similar discussion, two weeks ago, and they said we will never build another fossil fuel energy plant in this country, and we will shut down all the energy plants sooner or later. But a significant number, including Money Point, will be closed within the next 10 years. You look at the construction sector, every local government house that's being built is an A-rated house. There doesn't seem to be any sense of urgency that the agricultural sector is not on a 30-year window between now and 2050, but actually on a 10-year window. And I'm very disappointed when I hear people talking about uh, spreading slurry, a 30-year-old technology. Where are the new ideas? Where, from an environmental point of view, is it is sustainable? But also from all the farmers here, because they need leadership and they need ideas and they need answers. And I don't hear them coming from you. And I'm really disappointed. And I think... Uh, the Irish farmer Do you have is a question? Left high. My question is, why aren't you seeing this as urgently as every other sector of the economy? Because you don't appear to be. Thanks, David. Frank wants Could to come I, in. Yeah, look, I think that's a little bit unfair, if you don't mind me saying so, because I think um, uh, agriculture very clearly is seen as having, having a clear plan to get its um, emissions uh, reductions in order. Sorry, well... Okay, that's my view. We'll have to disagree. To, we'll have to agree to disagree. The plan is is what we what's loosely called the Chagas Mac Curve. It's the suite of emissions uh, of measures that will reduce emissions to allow us meet the, the targets in the Climate Action Plan. And whether it's old technology or new technology, it doesn't matter once it reduces emissions. So you know, there there are there are a, a whole heap of new things that are being researched that will probably come into play in the beyond 2030 phase. I'm not going. You know, can I bore you to kind of go through them now? Okay. Yeah. My farm who come here and they say Ireland <clears throat> is a green desert because yeah. of the ryegrass and because of the lack of multi yeah. species forage, they are going hand over fist ahead yeah. of what you guys are doing here. Uh, look, I, I they, 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 you know, I wouldn't. Okay. Do, uh, the point, the point has been. 
yeah. the point has been very well made and it's yeah. been heard. The I point has been well made. That, we let this last just gentleman to finish in. One, I think uh, people would say agriculture has a, a credible plan in order to, to meet its targets in the Climate Action Plan. People would question the plans for other sectors far more than agriculture. Agriculture had a plan years ago when other sectors didn't. Uh, so it's not today or yesterday that we've started working on this. So, as I said, whether they're old or new measures, I don't mind. I don't mind if there, someone else invented them 30 years ago. We'll use them now. And we, we won't be waiting 30 years for, for, for new measures. If, they're, if they'll work next year, we'll use them next year. Well, I think once, once you get into the language of enforcing, you're kind of losing the, you're losing the battle. Okay, and this is the last question of the night, I can promise you. Save the best to last. Okay, <laughs> good man. Dennis Strennan is my name. I'm chair of the Farm and Rural Affairs Committee with ICMSA. <clears throat> a couple of points I'd like to make, and then I have a question for the panel. For the gentleman down the back that's talking about the, the method of spread and slurry that's been in, in evidence since in the, for the last 30 years, it's been implemented in both Holland and Denmark for the last 30 years. And at the moment, Holland and Denmark are going back to question that method. Because every action has reaction. And sometimes the action is positive, sometimes the act action is negative. And in Holland and Denmark, they're finding that because of the size of these machines that are being used for it, it's absolutely destroying soil structure. No, but look at, it's, no, don't, don't start telling me they're different soils. Every soil <coughs> in the country here is different. So are you going to start picking out that it's suitable in this field and not in that field? I mean, you know, in general, in those two countries, they're looking at abandoning it because of the damage that's been done to the soil structure. So sometimes it's better to be behind the curve. But sure, what are we using? We know, we know what we're using because we know what's available on the market is two and a half. No, hold on now. Hold on. Stop interrupting the whole time. I'll answer your question. The, the machine that's been used in this country is a 150 or 200 horsepower tractor pulling a two and a half to 3,000 gallon, gallon tanker with a trail and shoe behind it. And ask anybody who's tried to get out on anything except perfect land with that machine and they'll tell you it doesn't work. Okay, does Dennis, work your strength. question because I've uh, given you loads okay. of rope now. <laughs> right. my, my question is, and I'll tie something in that I'd like to ask Pippa a question on. Pippa's promoting organic production of food. I sat on behalf of ICMSA on the organic strategy review group that sat for a full probably 15 to 18 months last year trying to encourage organic growth in, or the growth of the organic sector, sector in, section in this country. The problem is the, the price is not there for the final product. Well I disagree. No you can disagree. Phrase it as want. a question and we right. get her to answer. Uh, no the, the, when we sat it came to the end, the problem with organic, organics in this country is the two-year lead-in uh, period to get into organics because you're getting producing into an organic standard, but you're getting conventional price. And the t question I'd like to ask the panel is, the problem with all this intensive intensification of agriculture is the price to the farmer at the end. Okay. It's not economically viable to do what we've done 30 years ago. My father milked a third of the number of cows, and I'm a very small farmer. Uh, my father milked a third of the number of cows 30 years ago, but he had a better standard of living because today I'm supplying milk to Pat's company and I'm getting the same price as my father did in 1986. So when we get to the stage, the consumer demands he wants better, cleaner, greener, less carbon footprint, more sustainable, blah de blah de blah, but they still want, a bag, of, but they still want a bag of carrots for 49 cents. Okay, Pippa, we'll let you answer that. Um, yeah, I suppose in terms of actually the organic sector, I mean, farmers are paid for that first two years a at a higher rate to sort of get them over that hump, as it were. Well, I don't know. I, I, I would beg to differ, and I know organic farmers who would continue on as organic farmers without the subsidy, they are that engrossed in it because it works for them and they are getting the, the returns. I mean, we're, we, we, we... The strategy has come out and it's, it's a continuation of supporting the organic farmer because the market supports Okay, but the, we let her answer. The, 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 well, I, as I said, for my farm and our example of suckler you're cows... Depend, you're not depending on farmers. We were, actually, we are. I know, but there's very few farmers who actually depend wholly on farming. It's about a third, I think, is there? Would there be about that? A third of all farmers depend wholly on farming as their income. Most have either have a spouse or a partner who works, or they have an off-farm... Sorry, 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 there's something to bang for. You don't say the wife is working. I, I okay. No, I know, but we have to... No, 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 but you should never refer to a farmer wife. I didn't say wife, I said spouse. Yeah, but it doesn't 
I never said he or she. I said a farmer's spouse okay. or partner. I was covering. Sorry. I was very, very. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> anyway, right. Can, can I? Can I just, if you don't mind, just I'm conscious. I'm looking around the room. I can see some people are tired. Absolutely. Some of our panel might be happy to stick around. So maybe one to one, you might be able to grill them. You might be able to get some more information. I think you were a really engaging audience. You were really well informed. You can. <laughs> now, I, I, now I agree. There's a certain amount of leakage, I would say, from the organic sector. There's a lot of, say, um, say, suckler farmers, for example, who produce calves and will sell them as weanlings, and most of them will end up into the conventional sector. They don't follow on through. Now, we don't do that. We, we finish ours. We made that point. That was the only way to make money at it, was to, to finish them. And fair enough, like during the summer, we're getting 450 a kilo for our organic beef, which cost us far less to produce than... Dennis, you can talk to the panel afterwards. Thank you very much. You've been a superb audience. If you want to stay on, I'm sure you'll get to talk to some of them on their way out the door. But please give our panel a very big round of applause. Thank you. Thank you to our organisers tonight as well. Um, somebody said before we got started, just I think it was you, Pat, about Brexit and the lack of information at the time. Uh, so it's great that we're talking about the various issues now rather than after certain events. Absolutely. Yeah. I think it's the, the more of these discussions we have, the better. I think it's uh, we're probably playing catch up. I'd like to compliment the organisers of tonight here. I think it's very important. Obviously, your staff for having conducting a very, very interesting debate and well done. Thanks, William. Okay.